Hello everyone, this is Jackie Jones again and this is the last lecture in the Family Law Component of Litigation in Estate Practice. This lecture is going to be looking at um, interlocutory applications, just touching on a few, looking at statistics, um, just having a bit of a chat about costs etc as to how that's a little bit different in the family arena as well. So um, what we've talked about in Family Law is meeting the client obtaining instructions, having a consideration of the relevant law. Does the court have the jurisdiction to do what you're seeking it to do? You've of course explored dispute resolution with your client as you are obligated to do under a number of um, uh, aspects and that was addressed in um, the online workshop number one. And either an agreement has been reached and parties have filed an application for consent order or have embodied that agreement in a um, financial agreement. And if an agreement hasn't been reached, then it's all about filing an application, whether it's in the Family Court or the Federal Circuit Court. Now, um, this slide um, talks about, it's sort of got a bit of a flow chart, which is number five, about the beginning of the process. Um, sometimes you might have orders made on an interim basis that are pending final orders being made. Um, so this part of your assessment task will be in that um, component where it's an interim application to deal with a parenting matter. Um, then that interim application will be dealt with, finalised, and the decision might be pending the final decision of either the federal court or the family court judge. And then ultimately, if someone isn't happy with that judicial determination, appeal um, process exist. So what happens um, between the filing of an application and the final hearing? Um, you'll be familiar with following your civil litigation component which is all about the interlocutory matters, and there are a lot, um, and they are um, very helpful processes to assist in the court process if a matter has to go to trial. It's all about um, drilling down what's the issue in dispute and what evidence is required to establish um, and support your client's version um, and statement of those issues and facts. Importantly, in the family law arena, there is a duty um, to make a full and frank disclosure. Now, I've touched on the financial statement that will be filed with either the initiating application or application in a case if any financial orders are sought by a party. It is absolutely um, essential that this document be a true and accurate and complete account of your client's financial circumstances. Certainly from my experience, this is the document that uh, will be subjected to much scrutiny um, from the other side, whether it be a spouse maintenance application and the other side is looking as to your client's uh, expenses or their capacity to pay or um, in a financial um, adjustment between the parties application. Uh, important that you be aware that there is an obligation to update that financial statement if there is a change in their circumstances. Now a subpoena is a interlocutory process that you'll be familiar with. Um, of course um, there are three types of subpoena. I won't go through those because they're set out there on slide 8 for you. Important to check the filing fee. Now when a subpoena is um, issued by the court then it is served on usually the third party. Sometimes it's a party in the proceedings, but usually a third party. And when it's served, conduct money is provided. That conduct money is money to enable the third party to either come to court to give evidence, if it's that type of subpoena, or to bring the documents to court to produce them in response to the subpoena. Now, sometimes when subpoenas are issued, um, the third party requires costs to collate the material. It's not uncommon that banks will ask for money um, or accountants or um, any other third party where they have to go into storage or they have to collate a lot of documentation. That is different to the conduct money. 
usually what will happen is that that third party will contact the solicitor who has caused the subpoena to issue and uh, try to come to some arrangement as to what costs the um, solicitor who has caused the subpoena to issue will pay for that third party to prepare and collate all the documentation will often depend upon the size and extent of the documents being requested and also what um, financial costs they are proposing they be paid. If an agreement can't be reached, that third party has the ability to come to the court and ask for the court to determine their application for costs to be able to comply with the subpoena. But as I say, it is that type of cost is different to the conduct money that must be provided at the time of service. The one thing about subpoenas that always uh, intrigues me is that there are solicitors I know who love issuing them, but then they don't go and inspect the documents that are provided in response to a subpoena. Absolutely crucial that you do so, and when you go and inspect the documents, take your dictaphone, take paper, stick it notes to put on um, documents that you might think are relevant, make detailed notes. Um, we always had a practice in my last firm that the inspection notes from subpoenaed material were on a different coloured piece of paper, so we put them on blue so that when you were going through your file, you could um, easily identify the inspection notes of subpoenaed material. Um, these are very um, helpful to go to a barrister if they're briefed in the matter because it gives them an indication of what um, is in the documents and what evidence might be able to assist them in presenting the matter and, and uh, tendering those material that, that evidence to the court in the hearing. And um, don't be under any misapprehension, a lot of the subpoenaed material is tendered and becomes part of the evidence that the court must consider in the final determination of the matter. There are rights to inspect subpoenaed material and I have detailed that on um, slide 10. Always look at the relevant court that you are in. Do courts allow photocopying? If so, what are the terms and conditions of that? Um, is there an automatic right to go and inspect? Always, as I said, go and check. Now, discovery is another process. Um, you'll see here there's a bit of a difference in the Family Court and the Federal Circuit Court. Family Court uh, parties can uh, be forced to provide information by way of discovery. Federal Circuit Court, it's not allowed except um, if the Federal Circuit Court makes a declaration and that can be done. So a very helpful tool to see what the other side um, have. Again, really important, if there's going to be discovery, go and look at the documents. I was involved in a matter one time. It was a very long, um, convoluted matter. My file was 25 archive boxes. There had been discovery, but the other side hadn't really spent too much time coming and inspecting the documents that we had produced by way of discovery. And uh, we had produced uh, uh, recordings that had been taken by the wife that my client had then obtained possession of, of uh, um, conversations uh, between the parties that my client didn't know was occurring. Um, they, there were discs uh, made available, they were labelled and the other party uh, didn't um, take the time to come and inspect and it actually became a very critical matter in the case. Specific questions in the family arena, you might know them by another word in the civil litigation arena, maybe interrogatories you might be familiar with. Um, there are specific questions that are not allowed in the Federal Circuit Court, but again a declaration can be made. You need to be mindful of restrictions on the number of questions and what response period is required. Now another interlocutory process that I think um, is often not used effectively enough and that's a notice to admit facts. I think it's effective in the sense that it can really narrow down the matters to, that need to be proved at trial. Um, so the, the only one that you must need to be mindful of um, if you haven't had exposure to notice to admits before is that if you don't respond the fact or the authenticity of a document is taken to be admitted and that can have cost implications to you as the lawyer if that 
happens. So again, a risk management tool, you would diarise when the notice to admit facts was served and you will diarise the time period that you would need to respond. Now in the Family Court and Federal Circuit Court, um, expert evidence is regularly obtained. No longer um, do we have competing valuers that are engaged by parties. Sometimes there are shadow experts, but usually a joint letter of instruction is sent, um, an expert is agreed, and there are expert witnesses um, have specific duties to the court. Um, again, be very mindful if you are engaged with a jointly appointed expert that you um, deal with them with the full knowledge of the other side. It's not your witness, but a jointly appointed. There are a number of expert witnesses in the family court and slide 15 just outlines a number that can um, come into play in either parenting or financial matters to assist the court um, and the parties to present their case and to gain a, just another understanding of the matters and how to resolve them. Now cost is, is something that is very different to what you learnt in civil litigation. The starting point in the Family Law Act is that um, each party pay their own costs and it is uh, necessary to look at section 117 of the Family Law Act, um, particularly um, subsection 2A as to the criteria that needs to be uh, addressed in any cost application. I've seen too many young practitioners down in the Family Court or the Federal Circuit Court seek an order for costs. The Judicial Officer will um, then ask them to address the matters in the um, section as they're required to do and uh, they don't uh, proceed with the application for costs usually because they have no idea of what the Judicial Officer is talking about. So it's not a cost follow the cause like in civil process so be very mindful of that um, and often even in a situation where costs are warranted to be awarded they're not and you might want to reflect on why you think might think that that might be the case. So when we're looking at whether you go into the Family Court or the Federal Circuit Court, just have a look at the statistics on slide 17. You'll see, see there the consent order application 11,000. This is for the year 2012 to 13 for the Family Court. So you can see that a bulk of the work in the Family Court actually related to those consent orders where parties had reached an agreement prior to the filing of an initiating application. Let's have a look at the Federal Circuit Court. Look at the total of family law matters that they've filed, 83,000 in that financial year. But of course, break it down and you'll see that over 43,000 of those were divorce applications that are dealt with by a registrar in chambers. But you might be mindful, you might, be, you might have a knowledge of the um, comments that are being made certainly by a former Federal Circuit Court judge at the moment about the delays in the system and then, then the, um, the slowness of the Federal Government in appointing replacement judges when they retire. The time periods in the Federal Circuit Court and the Family Court on family matters are blowing out of proportion. This is a very challenging area of law and um, the last thing these people need is to be stuck in a court system for two years and that's certainly something that needs to be on everyone's uh, foremost thinking when to consider um, how we can settle this. And there's just a couple of graphs on slides uh, 19 and 20 as to the types of applications that are, that are filed. You can see there on slide 19 the high degree of interim applications that are filed in the Fed Circuit Court um, and uh, how they're made up of, look at the percentage of children only, um, huge number of parenting matters that the Federal Circuit Court has to deal with. And interestingly, a number of friends and I talk about this, this is in, this is in the framework of having mandatory mediation um, introduced by the, the um, Howard government and the, the need for the parties to go through family dispute resolution practitioners and yet we're still having an enormous amount of parenting matters being filed um, in the court process. 
So family lawyers, those of you now might have an interest in it, um, hopefully that this uh, component of the subject has given you a bit of a snapshot of what family law is all about. Um, and as a family lawyer, we really do try and um, seek outcomes for these um, couples, relationships, um, families as a whole that uh, will minimise the trauma that they're experiencing. So I hope you've enjoyed the course and have learnt something from uh, the various lectures and activities and good luck for your court uh, appearance on the 16th of January. Thank you. Bye.